Welcome back to the Gnome Show, everyone. I'm Joshua, your humble host, and it is my duty, nay, my pleasure, to trawl the briny depths of YouTube so that I may bring you the shinies. I cover short films of varying genres, video games, analog horror and sci-fi, and anything else that I think is groovy. I hope you'll enjoy tonight's offerings. Content for the Blood God. On with the show. Tonight we have um, uh, the um, uh, it's Office Space, the f philosophy of n doing nothing. Wisecrack edition. Uh, you all know Wisecrack. Um, go ahead and give them a sub and a like. Um, let's boogie. Ah, my shoulder hurts. Whew. To you by Manscaped, the brand dedicated to men's below the belt grooming and hygiene. Go What's up, guys? Jared here to talk about pop culture's greatest call to arms for slackers office space. Yes. The beloved 1999 film about hating your job, your boss, and your early morning commute has inspired and comforted the souls of many a bored administrative assistant. At first glance, office space seems to be a hilarious ode to uh, white collar laziness and Michael Bolton. Best Michael. depiction of a beatdown of an office uh, uh, right. piece of office equipment wow, ever put to camera. Name? <clears throat> but we think there's something else going on that may explain why the film has remained relevant for over 20 years. It's because Office Space embodies what some believe to be the most radical form of revolution. And we don't mean arson. Don't Let's find my out what all stapler. this has to do with a Dan Harmon lookalike in this week's Wisecrack edition on the philosophy of Office Space. And spoilers ahead for Office Space and a 19th century short story by Herman Melville. But before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to Manscaped. Manscaped is, well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's grooming and hygiene or two point. It's been trimmer blade totally free gifts when you get a satisfied programmer. Sorry, the better help I can I can dig, program, but where he spends his days getting nagged by his boss. At his girlfriend's request, he agrees to see an occupational hypnotherapist who puts Peter in a trance and then promptly dies of a heart attack. <gasps> Oh my god, Dr. Swanson! Peter's left in a state of blissful non give a fuckery, which he then pairs with flip flops and heads into the office. When the firm's new consultants meet a suddenly chillaxed Peter, they're so impressed by his boss like attitude that they literally make him one. So you're gonna fire Michael and Samir and you're gonna give me more money? That's how it happens sometimes, man. Hmm? Wow. Once Peter's promoted, he and his buddies plot to rob their company, and things go a little nuts. Now, for the purposes of this video, we're not going to be talking much about the scam that fuels the second half of the film. Rather, we're focusing on the film's legacy as a cultural artifact that speaks to employee disaffection. And uh, it's still relevant today, uh, just like um, um, Idiocracy. Like They're both very, very relevant today. They're culturally... Their touchstones uh, and they never age. And general workplace ambivalence. People don't proudly. We've all been in workspace uh, environments like this. Um, I'm. I, I can't say that I'm. Uh, I, I'm not uncomfortable in those spaces. I, I worked uh, in the. Um, I, I worked in uh, civilian DOD for a long time. Um, doing uh, office work uh, of a sort, um, beverage, food and beverage management, things like that, um, and some other offices too. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't like it, but uh, it is what it is. Uh. They display an office space poster to express their desire to steal millions from their corporate overlords. Well, maybe that, but mostly to encapsulate their fantasy of showing their boss how little they care. To understand why office space is so intoxicating, we need to take a super brief look at the history of the office as a social construct. But not the physical office, but say the office of the mayor. 
As philosopher Giorgio Agamben recounts in his book Opus Dei and Archaeology of Duty, the idea of the office really began with the institutionalization of the Catholic Church. If a priest tells you to do a hundred Hail Marys, well, that could just be some rando arbitrarily making up a number. But coming from a guy holding an official office with ties to the official church, it gives his order more legitimacy. Which is all well and good, but this construct of the office has had rippling effects. Scholar Benjamin Lewis Robinson builds off Agamben by suggesting that, from the beginning, this imbued the culture of work with a spiritual and transcendent element. By early modern history, Robinson writes, the notion of the efficacy of the office was generalized into a moral concept that defined the very agency of human beings. Doing your work wasn't just about a paycheck, it was about duty and purpose. In other words, your very you-ness is defined by what you do for work and how effectively you do it. Now Yes. Yes, if you're a carpenter, you are defined uh, by your ability to do it well. If you're a, if you're a politician, you are expected to be good at it. Uh, if you're a doctor, you're expected to be exceedingly good at your job. If you're a surgeon, you motherfucking better be good at your job. Um, so yeah, like some jobs absolutely define who you are. Like if you're, a, uh, if you were in the military or you're in the emergency services, uh, or you're a police officer, uh, or you're a civil service, um, uh, you know, employee of the civil services or, um, um, uh, government worker um, like these things like some of these jobs like if you work for the IRS these jobs define you because of the individual work that they comprise if you're if you say you're an industrial person and you work in a metal shop like you know like that's what you do it's not who you are like it may not be who you are but maybe back in the day it pretty much like oh yeah that's the guy that works the metal you know that's the blacksmith um, or that's the blacksmith shop. You can go and uh, get what you need repaired there. Um, or that's the uh, the metal shop. Yeah, that would that's modern times. That, that you know what I'm saying. So you're like you're a metal guy, or uh, you're the guy that does uh, that makes uh, furniture, or you're the guy that fucks around with computers, or you're the guy um, uh, that um, makes everything work in town. Like you do all the engineering. Uh, some of these jobs can define who you are, your office in general. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I have a job that do not necessarily defines. Well, maybe, maybe it does. Um, I'm. I, I work at a smoke shop, but I'm. I like. Uh, I like. Uh, I love working in small retail, um, small crowds. Uh, because big crowds give me anxiety. Um, um, and not like, you know, like, um, all, all consuming, uh, anxiety. I just don't like, I don't like working in, in a big store, uh, with lots of people. Um, it's too fast paced for me and I do get anxiety from that kind of environment. Um, unless I can get lost in the environment you know <laughs> you know if i can like not be front and center in front of a hundred thousand people or like the entire store be available to the no uh but roaming yeah i can do that or like in a certain department or doing a certain individual thing that's not bombarded by customers i can do that um but i do like retail and uh, i do like talking and working with people um and especially doing the things that i love um so yeah i guess you know like you're, you're i guess yeah the print principle yeah like uh, your office um like what you do defines who you are uh even today now, this may seem like a given, but that just shows how thoroughly our society buys into the idea. In this Absolutely. way, our very conception of ourselves is defined by our obligations as employees, mm -hmm. which sucks. The phenomenon of a person's work subsuming their identity is pretty clearly illustrated in office space. Well, 
this uh you know, so a lot of times in life you do jobs that you don't want to do because it pays well or it pays the bills um, or it's just the only job you can get or maybe you're not entirely skilled uh, in uh, maybe you don't have a lot of skills or you're young and you're still developing your skills or you're getting on your feet uh, which a lot of people in this world have done uh, have you had to do is get back on your feet um, Sometimes you're just down on your luck. Um, sometimes you're there because the, the things you do in life have brought you here, whether they be for good or bad. When Peter is casually asked by his boss to work not just one, but both days of the weekend. I'm going to need you to go Fuck ahead that, and sir. tomorrow. No. No, my weekend is mine. I need time to motherfucking disconnect from the work environment. I need to, uh, I need, I need to, I need time away. Um, I need time to sleep and then I need time to get things done that I can't do during the week. Um, you cannot have my weekend. Good, sir. No, no, you may not. So if you could be here around nine, no, that would be great. Absolutely okay. not. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Oh, oh, and I almost forgot. Uh, I'm also gonna need you to go ahead and come in on Sunday. So no, I don't work on Sundays. Fuck you. Okay. Because why would he have a life outside of his job? Unless you're gonna pay me time and a half, which, uh. uh like you can be like okay if you pay me but if you're not going to pay me then i will not similarly for his soon-to-be boo joanna every part of her identity is regulated by her waitressing job her flair or assortment of buttons and patches might seem to be showcasing her personality but we soon learn that such displays of individuality are actually mandated by her boss we need to talk about your flair really i wouldn't entirely have a problem with this but I could see your frustration. Well, okay, 15 is the minimum. Okay. Okay. Here, her very performance of selfhood is tightly controlled by her job. So we have this monolithic definition of the office as a place where we not only accomplish our life's work, but our lives as such. Is it any wonder we might come to resent the very institution? Indeed, the slacker lifestyle didn't begin with your cool incense burning aunt. In fact, we see a distinctly office spacian brand of slacktivism fermenting in author Herman Melville's iconic 1848 short story, Bartleby the Scrivener, A Story of Wall Street, which we oh, have wow. opted to illustrate vis a vis a delightfully corny 1969 short film adaptation because those eyebrows. <laughs> Melville's story chronicles through the eyes of a bewildered lawyer the exploits of his newest employee, a scribe named Bartleby, who, after working industriously for several weeks copying lengthy law documents, suddenly decides that he doesn't feel like it anymore. His vernacular choice has become immortalized in literature and pop culture. When asked to do anything he doesn't want to do, Bartleby simply says, I prefer not to. This starts with not wanting to proofread his copy, then escalates to refusing to copy at all, and eventually culminates in him refusing to leave the law office, where he just plain prefers to hang out all night while quietly staring out the window. The similarities between Bartleby and Peter's initial narratives are not insignificant. We're just going to stare out the window at the brick wall. Thank you very much. Passive aggressive bosses. Both labor in claustrophobic solitude, doing work they don't care about. Both appear to have a distaste for bureaucracy, and both will eventually seek solace in the great outdoors to varying degrees of happiness, but we'll get to that later. Most importantly, both turn their offices upside down when they decide to stop working. But let's start by looking at their defining characteristic, the choice not to work. According to Robinson, Bartleby's refusal to act is not a mere inaction. Rather, by preferring not to act, Bartleby ventures from sheer passivity into what he calls a second order passivity, which is performed in its ineffectiveness. He, and Peter as well, choose to be useless, in the very place where effectiveness is the highest calling. So inexplicable is Peter's behavior and his apparent unwillingness to do his damn job that the uncomprehending chummy consultants decide it must be evidence of superiority. He is, indeed, too good for his work and thus should be promoted. 
Peter's inaction becomes even more radical when considered with the culture of office politics. As Robinson puts it, the modern office is the space that ensures that it is easy to do one's duty, free from the burden of your conscience or the consequences of your actions. When your work is inherently disengaging, he adds, petty conflicts and trivial confrontations seem to take on epic proportions. This, he notes, would eventually manifest delightfully as office politics, or the cultural science of why the hell Cassidy chews her Greek salad so damn loud. <laughs> office politics are on full display in office space, whether in the form of Peter's boss claiming the best parking spot, or poor Milton being separated from his beloved stapler, and relegated to increasingly worse desk assignments. By refusing to engage in- You know what, if they put me in that fucking uh, basement, I would absolutely smoke my fucking face off. ...or even recognize office politics, as when Peter steals his boss's precious parking spot, stops dressing up, and comes in when he feels like it, a newly zen Peter acts like an anarchist, agitating against the very institution of the office. Bartleby and Peter bring something else profound to the office, as identified in the famous last line of Melville's story. After Bartleby inevitably starves to death in prison after preferring not to eat, his former boss exclaims, Oh, wow. Uh, Bartleby. Uh, humanity. Robinson argues that this line can be read as a recognition of the fact that Bartleby, in all his perverse peculiarity, is what humanity would look like in an office, were it ever to make such an appearance. In other words, for an office to function, it must strip us of said humanity. In Bartleby's refusal to do boring grunt work, his desire to do nothing, and his complete rejection of the mundaneities of office life, he displays an unwillingness to suppress his human desires for the sake of official duties. Similarly, tranced out Peter seems to embody the selfish pleasure-seeking impulses that unite us in humanity. He acts on base human desires in a world where everyone else simply ignores or represses them beneath a veneer of earnest goodwill and productivity. A human version of Peter looks like a guy who actually dates someone he likes, a guy who watches kung fu movies, a guy who smashes a faulty printer just for the heck of it. It's worth noting that these two slackers are backed by one influential philosopher, Slavoj Žižek. Žižek is a major proponent of Bartleby's style of political to. action, and is one of modernity's biggest advocates for saying, I would prefer not to, to, well, everything. Indeed, inaction, he argues, can be incredibly active. Zizek wrote in his book Violence that sometimes doing nothing is the most violent thing to do. If this sounds ridiculous, you've clearly never been ghosted. But why is Zizek <laughs> wearing the jersey of literature's greatest slacker? To understand that, we first need to contextualize Zizek's perspective on contemporary society. His argument goes like this. We live in a world of economic and political deadlock where multinational corporations have all the power and change feels low-key impossible. This is the net result of the 20th century, which was a time of intense action. Various countries experimented with socialism, fascism, communism, hippieism, bad hair every ism they could think of. It brought change, much of it not great, and resulted in our present day world. In Zizek's mind, all that action may have been misguided, or as he puts it, maybe we tried to change the world too quickly. And so we're stuck with status quo capitalism, rampant inequality, the Amazon on fire, and Cassidy not shutting up about essential oils. Along those lines, Zizek tends to think that, despite capitalism's numerous flaws, we don't yet have an alternative worth actualizing. As a result, any activity that we do take is not only doomed to fail, but actually risks aiding the powers that be. Zizek warns against engaging in localized acts whose ultimate function is to make the system run more smoothly. He cautions that, rather than fearing passivity, we should strenuously work to avoid pseudo-activity. That is, the urge to be active, to participate, simply as a way to mask the pointlessness of your actions. Wow. That right there describes the office work both Bartleby and Peter rail against. In refusing to copy legal documents or print out cover letters for boring reports, they are boldly asserting a truth that only doing nothing can communicate. That the office work which once dominated their lives is actually totally meaningless. While it may be tempting to tell your boss off that may only lead to new yeah like peter finding out finding out that he has to report to eight different bosses uh or that he's gonna have he's gonna hear the same complaint from eight different bosses Ugh. HR rules. You may complain of overwork, but they'll just add a pool table and call themselves heroes. Or you may want to burn the place down, but that will only put a fat insurance check in your boss's pocket. 
all of these things only make the system stronger. The most radical form of rebellion may be to do nothing. Lastly, it's important to look at the ending of both Office Space and Bartleby. What is the net result of each main character's defiance? In Office Space, the office is burnt down and Peter takes a job cleaning up the refuge with his next door neighbor. This isn't so bad, huh? Making bucks, getting exercise, working outside. Fucking in retreating it. from office life entirely, he sought a return to blue collar labor, getting as close to a pastoral paradise of sweat, calluses, hard work, and tangible results as modern city life might allow. For Bartleby, his refusal to leave the office eventually lands him in prison, where he spends all his time hanging out in the courtyard. Fittingly enough, he too has escaped the grind and fled to the outdoors. Sure, he starves himself to death, but at least he didn't die at his desk, right? So, what do you guys think? Does your effectiveness at work or school define you, and how do you feel about that? Do you fantasize about doing nothing like Zizek, Peter, and Bartleby, or is preferring not to no, just I a cop-out? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks to all our awesome <clears throat> patrons for supporting the channel and our podcast. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button, and as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace. Oh, fuck. This video... This video. So, um, I identify more with Peter's, uh, like, a uh, way out than anything. Like, uh, if you feel burnt out by what you do, then change what you do. Um, if you don't like what you do, um, plan for the future to do better or to do differently. But make sure you have a plan before you quit your job because that job pays your bills. I, um, so, um, the whole, like, um, the practice of a, uh, a nonviolent aggression where you, like, you know, like you quietly protest. Uh, by not, like, by just doing your job, not doing anything extra, just doing what the fuck you're supposed to do. Uh, sometimes that works, sometimes that not, uh, it doesn't when you're in the poor, uh, in the employ of a corporation, um, doing what you're supposed to do is the order of the day. <clears throat> but if you're in, in, in an environment where you are impactful and you just do what you're contract or your uh, job entails that can be very impactful on how everything operates uh, in, in where you work especially if people have come to rely on you um, and when you're trying to uh, leverage better pay or uh, realizing that you've been t severely taken advantage of it can be a powerful tool in your arsenal uh, in uh, doing something about the situation, uh, but sometimes it, <laughs> it nobody cares. But anyway, uh, that was uh, the philosophy of doing nothing, and that was actually very enlightening. Um, and I didn't know about the correlation between a Herman Melville short story. That's pretty fucking cool too. Um, but uh, tell me what you thought about this uh, in the comments. Uh, like, subscribe, and share. I love you all. Be safe, be happy, and healthy. I'll see you in the next one, guys.